people are starting to join and the live stream is started. So what are the impacts, uh, uh, you know, for example, in, I mean, Switzerland joining forces with the rest of the EU? What's, you know, Ben, that's just an astounding political change, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not as big a political change as some, as some people may make it, make it sound. So there have been precedences of this kind, but it did trigger some discussion here um, but it was actually in, in, in society, it was quite unanimous. It was mostly people being surprised that the government didn't immediately go along with the EU sanctions. Huh. Uh, but then they, they followed suit quite quickly when they realized that the um, common sense in the public uh, was quite pronounced. Wow. Well, that's, I, I, yeah. I was very pleased to see that. Yeah, and I think it was just, it's just too crazy to insist on being neutral. <laughs> and that says us, no, you are not really Swiss, Ben. Hi, no, I'm not Swiss. <laughs> I will never be, unfortunately. <laughs> I could probably get a Swiss passport, but that doesn't make you Swiss. Uh, no. You need to speak the language, which uh, is hard are, unless are you go any... up here. Are any refugees making it into Germany, Hagen? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, sure. I think many. Yeah, yeah. Even to Switzerland well, now. I think Helmut knows the situation much better than I do because I've been here since, since uh, weeks. Yeah, no, we are going to accept a few refugees as, as, as many as possible here at the Institute. Yeah. But it's predominantly uh, women and, and kids, right? Well, scientists also. Uh, okay, two levels. Yeah, predominantly women and kids on the non-scientific level, if you want. But we're also accepting scientists here at the Institute. That's mm. right. But they're going to have a hard time getting out uh, unless they're above a certain age because, right. because of, the, of the doctrine. Right. Mm. <coughs> Good morning, Helmut. Good morning. Great to is see it, you. Is it spring now in Göttingen? Sure, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes spring only you know, takes, okay. you need to wait to Easter for it to occur, right? That's true, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Ron, good to Hi. see you, Ron. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, fine. This but is. I, uh, I warned uh, Ron today that you are going to give a talk, and he immediately asked for the. <laughs> Excellent, great. I'm. Uh, you know, I, I, Ron, you're incredibly broad, but I, I, I wasn't really expecting that you would, <laughs> you know, become a protein folder. Uh, it, it, you know, you're you're tied up in these beautiful stereochemical plasmonic <laughs> electron spin sorts of ideas so how's rachel how's good. the family good just well doing well good i i just actually i was at upenn in person and uh had a long talk with abe nitsan and he uh -huh. he has great memories of of uh of his time, you know, obviously uh, he's doing very well. Yeah, I know, I know. We have another rare uh, 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 visitor today, WE. Hello, WE. Oh, is WE with us? Great. Hello, Gilad. Hi, David. How are you? Hey, AW, how you doing? Good, good. Thank you. Hello, hello. Well, this is a star-studded audience. Everybody, I think I saw to hear the great saw, talk that you're going to give soon. <laughs> I saw no, Peter. Peter, no, get no, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> 
Okay, but, but I think numbers are sort of slowly stabilizing and I think yeah. we're already three minutes behind. So let's start. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Great to see so many of you joining our webinar on protein folding and dynamics today. It should actually, I think, being called today RNA folding and dynamics. So welcome all of you. Uh, I know hundreds of years ago, scientists used to be universalists, many of them studying all disciplines of natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, sometimes also spicing it up a little bit with philosophy. Of course, nowadays, these days are over, uh, but it seems to me as uh, if our speaker today uh, is still close to this ideal, because honestly speaking, his uh, work really covers many disciplines in chemical physics and biophysics, ranging from spectroscopy of combustion radicals, molecular ions in uh, supersonic jet expansions, um, over quantum state resolved scattering at gas liquid gas solid interfaces, ultrafast imaging of plasmonic nanostructures all the way up to single molecule kinetics of uh, nucleic acids. And so it really gives me a a great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce today our speaker, David Nesbitt from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Now, David's work on single molecule RNA folding really addressed a large number of problems that I think protein scientists can uh, very much uh, relate to. For example, formation of tertiary contacts in RNA folding that would explain how ribosomes actually fold up and gain their catalytic activity electrostatic interactions and device screening and their impact on the flexibility of RNA. He demonstrated, for example, that magnesium ions that are really important to facilitate folding of RNAs um, don't do that by screening electrostatic interactions, but by lowering the entropy penalty uh, for folding. And on top of that, he also studies more complicated system investigating the effect of crowding on um, RNA folding. Now, um, above all of it, you also established two uh, thermodynamic variables in single molecule nucleic acid folding experiments, namely temperature and pressure, that now allows them really to get insights into transition state properties um, that are very uh, difficult to get by other means. For example, if you think about changing solvent condition, it's not the same thing. And so we are very happy to have him with us today. Uh, but before, before I hand the stage over to David, a few words about his CV. David studied physics and chemistry at Harvard and received his PhD at the University of Colorado, in which he actually worked on the theory of liquid phase reactions and laser triggered photochemical reactions. He then moved on to the UC uh, to do his postdoc at UC Berkeley, of which he started his own group uh, at the University of Colorado as an assistant professor. Since 1992, he's full professor there for chemistry and biochemistry, and since 2017, also professor for physics at the University of Colorado. Now, given all his seminal contributions, David received many accolades, um, such as the Wilson Award of the American Chemical Society, the Burke Medal from uh, the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry, the Presidential Rank Award that he received at the White House, and really many, many more, too many to be listed up here. On top of that, David has uh, been very active in serving scientific community by uh, serving as editor in JFIS Chem, JChem Fis Chemical Reviews, uh, but he's also been in scientific advisory boards of many research institutions all over the globe. Now, uh, today, David will tell us on how the kinetics and thermodynamics of single nucleic acids actually respond to temperature and also a little bit about uh, to pressure. Um, but before I hand the stage over to you, David, let me just ask everybody to please mute your, uh, mute your microphones such that we can listen to, to David without interruptions. And um, I would also like to announce our next speaker in a month from now on April 11th, we, are, we will be welcoming Catherine Royer. So with this, um, David, thanks a lot for being with us today and uh, the stage is yours. I, I guess I need to be, yeah, good. Yeah, you can share your screen now and... Um... Excellent, good. Is that, is that working? Yeah, can it looks very good. Can people can see it? Good. Uh, Hagen, thank you for a very uh, overly generous introduction. And let me really re-extend my gratitude uh, to, to the three of you for organizing just a fabulous seminar series uh, 
that I think has kept us intellectually nourished during this crazy pandemic time. Uh, so I, I, I'm bringing uh, today really sort of a, a different way of thinking. This, um, this is not about proteins. This is really about nucleic acids. Uh, and let me see if I can, does this, Okay, so I'm, I, I'm going to need to stop and then restart because it's it apparently does have. Uh, so maybe you should first switch out of present the mode and then uh, share screen. Right, right. Maybe, maybe that's right. the way. I think that's what I need to do. Yeah. So let me do a share screen and then yeah. Can people see that? Is that working? Good. Oh, that looks good. Good. Okay. So it look. This is a rough, uh, you know, collage of areas of of our current biophysical interest, and I, I'm really going to just be giving you vignettes. Uh, but a lot will be associated with the uh, the folding, the formation of tertiary structures uh, in RNA. But I'm going to really try and utilize as a prism for thinking about these different topics, uh, the ideas of uh, crowding, heating, and hydrostatic pressure, right? So that's going to be the idea using different uh, uh, intensive variables to be able to manipulate the, both the thermodynamics and the kinetics of nucleic acid folding. So, all right, so I, I thought I'd start out with some caveats because I, I have a deep humility speaking to this audience, uh, you know, about nucleic acids. But I first thing I want to say is no proteins have been hurt in the preparation of this talk, right? So uh, it, this is really going to be very much a physical chemist view of single molecule biophysics but with a completely RNA, DNA, nucleic acid centric uh, perspective, okay? So I, University of Colorado, of course, is a place where nucleic acids and particularly RNA are, are, are extremely important, right? So uh, the basic idea is that we're exploiting intensive variables like temperature and pressure to explore free energy landscapes for folding at the single molecule level. And I, I think actually there is an appropriate uh, reason for uh, having uh, such a talk in this seminar series, because it allows us to compare and contrast with the behavior uh, that's seen in proteins. Uh, but what I want to make sure everyone appreciates, particularly uh, hopefully the many theoreticians out there in the audience, is that single molecule RNA kinetics and thermodynamics really are providing a very fertile opportunity for testing and benchmarking rigorous the theories. So this is really an invitation for future collaboration, okay? All right, so since not everyone is completely up to speed on nucleic acids, let me uh, just give you a few slides on you know, RNA 101, if you will, right? And this is a plot that I've always found fascinating, and that's the percent of DNA that does not code for proteins as a function of nominally, you know, sophistication of the organism. And what one sees is a strong correlation. The more sophisticated the organism, uh, the, uh, the greater the percent <laughs> Uh, of non-coding DNA, right? Uh, and what this translates into is that you know, most of the human genome is transcribed to RNA, but less than 1.5% is used to directly form proteins, right? And so it really begs the question, is it really true that 99% of RNA is wasted? And the answer of course is an emphatic no. It's used for post-transcriptional modifications, self-splicing, catalysis, gene regulation. And what I'd like to leave you with is the idea is that RNA really has a more protein-like biochemical role in addition to its uh, importance uh, as a genetic source of information, right? 
And let me give you one example of this. This is a famous example in, in Colorado, but this is the example of the sort of biogymnastics that RNA has learned to do, evolved to do. So this is a good example of what they call intron splicing, where you have some uh, RNA transcript that knows how to cut out a piece of itself, the intron, and then generate a mature RNA that just connects the exons, right? And it's a biochemical pathway. Uh, it occurs, you know, uh, you know, without uh, ATP, uh, and it really is an opportunity for a messenger RNA to reconfigure itself. And this is really uh, an example from the famous tetrahymena a group one intron that Tom Cech, uh, you know, got the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering, you know, some some decades ago. But it it really emphasizes that the structural diversity of RNA really is is I mean it's very protein like uh, in that it it's an important uh, pathway for biocatalysis and even molecular recognition. So I hope to give you examples of each of those. So there's one other really important aspect of, uh, of RNA, uh, and that is that it's very much what they call a hierarchical folder. So if I have some primary sequence of RNA and I let it fold, it folds on what, forgive me, what I call a fast time scale, maybe sub 100 microseconds, into some secondary structure, right? That's not as fast as fast folding proteins, but nevertheless, it's pretty fast. And then on a much slower time scale, on the order of milliseconds to seconds, it folds into a biochemically competent tertiary structure. So this really provides an experimentalist with a beautiful opportunity to be able to focus on the kinetics, the dynamics of this slow tertiary interaction acquisition uh, as a mechanism for studying uh, the dynamics of RNA, okay? And you know, something that again is very similar to that of protein is that the landscapes for folding of RNA is very rugged. So you know, this is a canonical picture often used for proteins, um, but let me just, again, give you the key message. RNA, as Hagen said, requires divalent magnesium to fold. Uh, and it really is a highly fluxional. It occupies an ensemble of many dynamically interconverting structures. And one of the consequences of this that I think is interesting is that RNA can misfold and stay misfolded for seconds to hour long timescales. It's really remarkable, uh, but it will often eventually get to the right uh, folding conformation, sometimes immediately, but sometimes gets stuck in some of these deep, deeply rugged landscape uh, architectures, right? And so what I would, the argument I would make is that static structure of RNA is really only one piece of the puzzle. Crystallography is not enough uh, to tell us the full story. And the frontier in RNA really is all about the dynamics of folding, the kinetics, and even the thermodynamics of how these structures acquire their shape, okay? So with that as background, I'm just gonna give you sort of a, a menu of what we're gonna talk about today. I've already given you more or less the motivation. I'll spend a few slides on the experimental background, but you guys are all pros. But I really wanna spend time really on sample vignettes. And the first one again is gonna be getting to this idea of tertiary acquisition uh, interactions at the single molecule level. And then I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about uh, how we can use temperature dependent uh, folding of RNA to be able to disentangle enthalpy from entropy in the folding landscape. And 
you know, a more recent area for us is really using hydrostatic pressure or osmotic pressure or molecular crowding to look at the equivalent free volume landscapes for nucleic acid folding. So that's that's the that's the scope of what we're going to talk about today. And this gives me an opportunity to thank at the outset really three generations of graduate students and postdocs that have really helped me think about these sorts of problems. Okay. So all right. So experimental background, we've got again experts in the crowd. This is, you know, the classic W. Murner, you know, uh, only single, you know, we're going to ban ensemble averages here. Uh, but basically, it's using uh, pulsed uh, picosecond lasers to be able to excite in a confocal microscope individual uh, tethered or freely diffusing molecules, uh, exciting fluorescence, uh, you know, fluorescent molecules, uh, looking at conformational changes by virtue of energy transfer between those uh, uh, donor and acceptor dyes, and then looking at the single photon by separating it by polarization and color and having it land on individual single photon counting uh, detectors, okay? So this is all based on time correlated single photon counting. And as a result, every photon represents it, its own experiment and we store every experiment by color of photon, polarization of photon, which is quite interesting for being able to look at maybe three-dimensional conformational dynamics, fluorescent decay times, and then what I call wall clock time. And the beauty of this is that the fluorescent decay time information really is on the picosecond to nanosecond time scale. The wall clock information is on the nanosecond literally to kill a second time scale. And so this is really a technique that allows one to see single molecule kinetics over, you know, arguably 12 orders of magnitude dynamic time, time scales. So that, that, that's the idea. And the key method is well known to you all. And that's this idea of fluorescent resonant energy transfer. And that's, Simply stated, we're really relying on the very steep one over R to the sixth dependence of energy transfer between donor and acceptor. So when we are in some unfolded conformation, we excite the donor, we see photons from the donor. But if we're in a folded conformation, uh, we can have energy transfer between donor and acceptor, and we see distinct changes in the fret value, and we can monitor that as a function of time, okay? So, and of course, the environment uh, for my single molecule, right? So uh, the strategy, the key strategy here is that, at the start at least, is that we're really going to take the physicist's perspective and simplify, simplify, simplify. So what I'm doing is I'm taking just one domain out of this tetrahymen, a group one intron. And there's here's an isolated, very common, ubiquitous tertiary interaction that is, um, I don't know why I'm not able to, some another I can't, something happened. I, I, I'm not moving forward. I'm going to need to restart again, I'm afraid. Sorry, I apologize. No problem. Let me, uh, let me uh, go here and... Can you see that? Yeah. Or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah we do see it. Can you Good, okay. So the questions really are, you know, how does RNA fold and stay folded? And in particular, at least at this initial instant, we're looking at the kinetics and thermodynamics of these individual um, tertiary interactions. And we're interested in the role of the environment and how we can manipulate the environment via temperature, pressure, osmolites, crowding, monovalent, divalent sorts of uh, uh, concentrations, right? And again, 
we're really looking at a single nucleic acid interaction that I'm, that's called the tetraloop, tetraloop receptor interaction. And it's this very tight GAAA tetraloop that is a tight loop that actually forces the, uh, the nucleotides to, to flip out and then become uh, accessible to a bubble uh, that is the tetraloop receptor. And this is an ubiquitous tertiary uh, interaction motif that acts, if you, if you like physical analogies, it's sort of like a piece of Velcro that holds this tight loop um, in, uh, in stable conformation, right? And we have multiple ways of being able to look at this, but, and I'll just show you two, but we can look at this by freely diffusing molecules through uh, a laser focus. And what we can do is look at bursts uh, and we can look at the color of the bursts and the burst color tells us about the, uh, the folded versus unfolded state of the tertiary interaction. And by looking now at the statistics of these bursts, you learn about the equilibrium properties of these freely diffusing molecules. And that's particularly handy if, if one is concerned about uh, the influence of any other type of uh, you know, attachment to a surface influencing the equilibrium properties. But that, that's only one, one way to look at it. We can also use uh, raster scan confocal microscopy. And the idea here is that we raster scan some sample over the laser. And then now we have tethered molecules that are tethered to the surface via biotin, streptavidin, uh, connections. And then we can focus on a single molecule and observe the folding and unfolding in real time. Okay. And I, I think you've seen many, many talks on the, these sorts of ideas. And we've got W. Murner in the audience. The statistics of the folding and unfolding can be monitored in two state folding systems by looking at the statistical distribution of what I call docked or undocked states. So here's a trajectory as the molecule folds and unfolds, and we can either collapse that into a histogram, in which case we really learn about equilibrium properties, or more interestingly, we can look at the dwell times that the nucleic acid spends in one state or another and really get the rate constants for folding or docking or unfolding or undocking. So this really gives us the opportunity to be able to look at kinetics, transition states, overall folding, overall unfolding. Okay, so I'm gonna, with that as sort of a first big picture idea, I'm gonna try and sort of show you how we can now use temperature to uh, unpeel uh, the kinetics and dynamics uh, of RNA folding. So it's a very simple idea. We come in with our green laser that can excite a single molecule attached to some uh, surface, but then we can surround that green laser with uh, a 1.4 micron laser. It can be either CW or pulsed. Uh, these are actually rather inexpensive uh, telecommunications lasers. But the gorgeous aspect of that is that they can be made to be resonant with liquid water, the overtone band. And I don't know if you can see me, but I always say that God gave us two hands so that we can demonstrate the symmetric and the asymmetric stretch uh, of water, right? So this is actually an excitation of an overtone a combination of the asymmetric and symmetric stretch of water and that rapidly deposits heat into a sort of a, what I call a nano column. It's, it, you can vary it, but it can be three, three to 30 microns in diameter. 
And it really represents about a nano cc or a picoliter of volume. So this is a way of looking at, you know, I call them single molecule bathtubs uh, from temperatures that can range from ambient literally up to the boiling point. We, we rarely go that high, but we often will go maybe up to 70 degrees, okay? And Peter, I'm sure you're there and you're, and you're grimacing at my use of Boltzmann here, but I like to use this picture just to indicate that it's this temperature dependence that allows us to be able to highlight the importance separately of entropy and enthalpy, okay? And what this requires though, of course, is that you need to be able to measure the, the temperature. And here's where single molecule studies and uh, time correlated single photon counting really work so beautifully. So here are fluorescent decays of rhodamine B as a function of temperature. And what you can see is that there's a systematic increase in the fluorescent decay rate with temperature. And physically that's due to a turning on of non-radiative pathways with thermal excitation of, the, of these dyes. And we can be good physical chemists and just analyze that in a typical Arrhenius fashion and really achieve uh, an understanding. Think of this as a calibration between temperature and the non-radiative component of the decay. And that really allows us to be able to uh, have a calibration in situ for the temperature uh, of our single molecule bathtubs. So that's the idea. Precision lifetimes from time correlated single photon counting you know, gives an in situ probe of nano bathtub temperatures at you know, about plus or minus half a degree centigrade level. So, so what's that allow us to do? Again, as physical chemists, it allows us to do classic Van't Hoff analysis for nucleic acid folding, but now at the single molecule level. And here's just one example. This is for a folding of, a, uh, of the tetraloop uh, receptor interaction. And you can see, this is the classic, you know, Van't Hoff analysis that we teach all our undergraduates, but you can see the positive slope here is telling us that the enthalpy of folding is negative. So it's telling us that forming this tertiary interaction is an exothermic process. But by looking at the intercept, you can see the intercept is very strongly negative. And so what that is saying is that the folded state of the nucleic acid tertiary interaction is more ordered. Okay, all right? So, all right, uh, let me just push that a little further. We can also look, since we can see kinetics, we can look at transition states. And there are many, many formulations of transition state theory. I'm using one of the simpler ones where we have some type of a, a you know, approach frequency, and then it's being modulated by some free energy uh, of the transition state that can be deconstructed into enthalpic and or entropic and enthalpic components. And you can again do a type of you know, Van't Hoff analysis, but this might be better called transition state theory or Eyring analysis. And you can see that you get this beautiful linear behavior of the logarithm of the rate constants. And each of those slopes and intercepts tells us now about the entropy of achieving the transition state and the enthalpy of achieving the transition state. And you can see that with this positive slope here, we have a slightly exothermic formation of the transition state, but with a dramatic uh, 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 you know, uh, decrease uh, in the enthalpy, uh, uh, you know, uh, achieving uh, you know, the the transition state. And likewise, if we look at the transition state moving on to the folded state, we can get 
you can really see that uh, don't be confused by the double negative. That's to help you know put this in the right direction. But it's a strongly uh, you know endothermic reaction to go from the folded state back to the transition state, but it's strongly exothermic to go from the transition state to the folded state. And this gives me an opportunity to just summarize in a very simple way. And this is really typical, not always, but very typical for nucleic acids. What you have is a modest change in enthalpy to get to the transition state, and then a massive release in enthalpy to get to the folded state, okay? And conversely, the barrier to get to the transition state is almost always entropically dominated, and but afterwards, there's only very small change in the entropy. So the idea is that the transition state is very often a highly ordered arrangement, but where you haven't yet formed the hydrogen bonds that release the enthalpy for the folding process. So that's summarized here uh, about what barrier entropies are often dominated by uh, for docking and undocking. And I just really wanna highlight that there's always this delicate balance between uh, enthalpies and entropies uh, in, in, in nucleic acid folding. And again, let me stand back and just make a big picture statement, uh, obvious I'm sure to many of you, and that is that you know, nature rarely has huge free energy changes, but what it often has is huge barriers to changes. And so the idea is we can have very large barriers on the order of 15 kcals per mole, sometimes even higher, uh, but for an overall very modest change in free energy between uh, unfolded and folded conformations. So what I like to say is that, uh, you know, biology loves a close fight, okay? Right? Biology doesn't want to have huge free energy changes, but it loves having large transition state barriers. And that's really what controls nucleic acid folding is transition state barriers. And in particular, the myriad ways that biology has of controlling transition state barrier heights, like for example, magnesium okay, for nucleic acid folding. So I'm gonna just give you a couple examples of this. And uh, Hagen mentioned this at the very beginning, but this was really quite a surprise to us and the community. That is that, well, it's not a surprise that magnesium was, was required for RNA folding, but the conventional wisdom at the time was that the way magnesium promotes folding is that it acts like sort of two hands that can grab on two different phosphate anions and pull them together, right? That's a natural way of thinking, but if so, that would predict that at higher magnesium concentration, the folding would become more and more exothermic. But in fact, that's not what we see. So here I have Van Hoff plots as a function of magnesium, and what I want you just to recognize is that the presence of magnesium does not change the slope of the Van Hoff plots, it just changes the intercept, okay? So the idea is that we have constant slopes or stated differently, delta delta G is approximately zero, but we have systematically increasing intercepts, okay? So delta delta S is greater than zero. And stated simply, really what it means is that magnesium-induced RNA folding is not an enthalpic property, but arises from a surprising decrease in the entropic penalty for folding. And, you know, there are many thoughts about this, but it, we, it's consistent with magnesium pre-organizing uh, the tetraloop receptor prior to the folding event. So it, it minimizes the entropic penalty by 
making the entropy lower even in the folded configuration, or sorry, in the unfolded configuration. So that's one way in which uh, th this can work. So let me give you another example. And let me try and keep an eye on the time here. Uh, here's a construct of, uh, of DNA. So, and what we're looking at here is a DNA uh, uh, hybridized to another DNA where we have dyes that are widely separated, okay? And when the DNA freely uh, uh, diffusing DNA strand is hybridized to my tethered DNA strand, it keeps the uh, donor and the acceptor at large distance. But when the DNA dehybridizes or melts, then this loop allows the self, uh, well, it allows the donor to become closer to the acceptor. And what you can shift, see is that this shifts my DNA construct from a low fret state to a high fret state. And here's sort of an example of a, a, a wide, scale, wide scale view of it where you have mostly green or a low fret state of becoming mostly red or high fret states in the presence of heating. But what we do is we can now come in with our single molecule or maybe a broader footprint. And what we do is we can excite, uh, you know, maybe 50 or 60 of these molecules uh, at once with our, with our laser and change the, uh, both the time duration with which we heat, as well as the incremental temperature change with which we heat. And we can count the survival probability of the molecules that have not melted. So we can look at the melting kinetics of DNA by looking at the survival probability. And here's an example of this. What you can see is that uh, if we only heat up to below the melting temperature of the DNA, and maybe for uh, some small time window of two seconds, that we have only very small changes in the survival probability. But if we increase the temperature and also increase the duration over which we heat, we end up having a much more dramatic loss of survival probability and essentially all the DNA melts. And the key idea is that the shapes that we see are always sigmoidal in nature. And so that's inconsistent with a single two state system. And so our analysis really has been based on a more complicated kinetic scheme for simplicity We've treated it as a sequential kinetics with identical rate constants. And if you use that as a mechanism, you know, this real requires something on the order of three to four transition states before the DNA actually melts. So we can look at this survival probability as a function of the temperature increase and the heating duration. And we always get this sigmoidal decrease, and that's really evidence for some more complicated sequential kinetic process for the melting of DNA. And let me just say that you know, we've used a simple statistical mechanical model based on end frame, and I, I just sort of highlighted here, I'm sure there are many you know, more sophisticated models that people like Helmut or Peter could, could help us with, but the idea is that you fray in from the ends rather than start in the middle. And that's just because the statistical mechanics of fraying in from the ends to entirely melt the DNA is much more uh, likely than, uh, uh, than actually dehybridizing entirely from one end versus the other. So again, a simple message. So let me take the last, uh, few moments to talk about pressure and viscosity and crowding effects. And so here's one of the famous pictures by uh, Goodsell and, and Kendill. Uh, 
And basically, I just want to remind you that the cell, cellular cytoplasm is a very crowded environment where we might have on the order of 20 to 30 percent by volume nucleic acid, proteins, osmolites, and the cell is really quite viscous, right? And we might be interested in the impact uh, on RNA kinetics and thermodynamics, right? So uh, I'm a physical chemist. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, Harold Cromers was a fantastic physicist who became a physical chemist. Peter will correct me maybe, but I think for about four years of his life, he became a physical chemist. And in those four years, he completely changed the world of physical chemistry. But he had this beautiful theory, Cromers theory, in which you could look at uh, moving over some transition state barrier by fluctuating Brownian motion. And he had this very poetic description. He thought of these as noise assisted reactions where continual buffeting of Brownian motion would push you over a barrier. And, but a clear prediction of this Cromer's theory is that uh, you know, the viscosity influence should be symmetric for both the folding and the unfolding state because you are slowing down in the high friction limit, both the kinetics, okay? So the prediction from Cromer's theory is that, is that the rate constants should all be inversely proportional to the viscosity. So, all right, so we can test that. Uh, and so here's folding of this tertiary interaction as a function of glycerol. And what I think you can see is that as I increase the glycerol, the time durations that I spend in the folded and unfolded state, they both systematically increase. So the rate constants are both, for folding and unfolding are both decreasing. But if I look at the equilibrium property, the equilibria are not changing, right? So the take home message is that both rate constants are decreasing very nicely in inverse proportion of the viscosity, but the equilibrium constants and therefore the free energies are completely independent of the uh, viscosity, right? So that's the idea, I've already stated it, perfect balancing between folding and unfolding rate constant dependence on viscosity to maintain a perfectly balanced equilibrium constant. And that's consistent with Cromer's theory in the so-called high friction limit. I can look at crowding now. Uh, and so now the idea is, what if we have a crowded medium? Uh, and what I want to indicate is that the rate constants for folding and unfolding both are quite sensitive to the amount of excluded volume. And here I'm using sort of polyethylene glycol, uh, you know, uh, just as a way of, of sort of, you know, it's, it's of common use for a, a volume crowder. You can see that the behavior is even super exponential in the excluded volume for the folding rate. And it's a bit more weakly, but nevertheless depends uh, on the excluded volume for the unfolding rate. Okay. So here we have this exponential growth in k-fold, a decrease in k-unfold. So what this really predicts is a, a super exponential crowding effect on the equilibrium constants. So you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I go to simple theories. So what we've basically gone to is what you, know, you might call the spherical cow limit of statistical mechanics, if we think about our tetra loop, tetra loop inter, uh, uh, receptor interaction as a sphere, and we look at what size sphere would be consistent with this type of free energy change as a function of excluded volume, you can have a very simple theory that is extrapolatable to under, let's say, cell cellular conditions. And what it predicts is that you'd have something greater than five kcals per mole or on the order of eight kT under typical cellular crowding conditions. And of course that means 
something like an e to the eighth or about a thousand fold effect on nucleic acid folding and unfolding kinetics in cells. Okay, so that's sort of an interesting take home message. Okay, and as my final topic, I wanna talk just for a few moments about hydrostatic pressure on nucleic acid folding. So let me just set the stage. Let's say that there were a change in volume on the order of 100 cubic angstroms. So that's, that's about 60 centimeters cubed per mole. And at room pressure, that's not very much in terms of free energy change. But by the time you get up to 1,000 atmospheres or even 10,000 atmospheres, you have something approaching an electron volt uh, in terms of impact uh, on your free energy. So it's an extraordinarily large effect as you go to higher pressures. So experimentally, well, we saw this beautiful talk last month by Odd Box. So I, I won't spend time on this, but, but this is now at the single molecule level. And so instead of using Phil Amphenrude's beautiful methods, uh, which really looked quite complicated to us, we're using capillaries. And here's a capillary that is up at 4,000 atmospheres, okay? And the idea is that we can look inside that capillary with time-correlated single photon counting. And so here's our pressure gauge. It's very, you know, it's very old school. So there's the pressure at Colorado. Well, actually, Boulder's pressure is a little lower than that even. But here's hydrothermal vents. Here's the wreck of the Titanic. Here's the bottom of the ocean. This is the bottom of the Marianas Trench, right? And we're up at, in this case, more like 3,000 bar, okay? So even bigger. So really, the idea is that uh, we've got access from zero to a, or one to a, a, a many kilobar. And you know, many people ask, how can the glass handle it? Basically, we're just really exploiting the fact that long, thin objects are much more stable under pressure. And for all of, all of you that have had your cheeks get tired blowing up balloons for a birthday party, you know exactly what I mean. It's really hard to blow up those long, thin balloons. Okay, So the last example is now DNA hairpins. Uh, and you can see what we're doing here is we have a hairpin uh, where we've got some complementary sequence, where we've got donor and acceptor, and then we have uh, a poly A loop. Okay, and the idea is we can look at the kinetics and thermodynamics of this DNA as a function of the sequence and length uh, of my DNA uh, hairpin. Okay, right. So let me show you what this looks like. This is sort of early data, but nevertheless, you can see that at low pressure, we really prefer the folded state, the high fret state. But systematically, as a function of pressure, we systematically shift over into the unfolded state. Or in other words, we melt the DNA by pressure, okay? And we can do the same sort of Van Hoff analysis as a function of pressure. You can see that the slope of this is really reporting on the free volume change uh, for folding of DNA. Okay, so uh, what this slope implies is that DNA must expand on folding, uh, and it expands by for maybe, of course, its expansion depends upon the length of the sequence, but for maybe a six nucleotide sequence, it's as much as about 17 cc's per mole. So about on the order of the volume of a single water molecule. Okay? So pressure induced melting or denaturation. This is qualitatively consistent with protein behavior, uh, but it's interestingly in contrast with excluded volume effects from crowding, where we could see that crowding basically uh, led to, uh, uh, you know, to en enhanced folding, which really had, was equivalent to a free volume change, which was negative, okay? And I just put as a last thing that we can look at kinetics 
under high pressure as well. And all I really want, this is now for a ribo switch, but what I really, the point I wanna make is that this allows us to deconstruct pressure dependent effects into its folding and unfolding contributions. And what we can see is that this melting occurs by a decrease in K fold and an increase in K unfold, right? So what that really is telling us from a simple PCHEM perspective is that these free volume changes are monotonically increasing as I go from the unfolded through the transition state to the folded state. And I'll just leave that we're looking at these manganese ribo switches in order to explore the sensitivity to the ligand cavity because a canonical picture for pressure induced melting is that we've got voids in the nucleic acid. And what we wanna look at is what happens when we try and fill those voids with ligands, right? So with that, let me just summarize and really just say, you know, a number of things that I've said many times, critical role of entropy versus enthalpy, you know, super exponential impact of crowding, pressure dependent melting, but let me leave with this idea that this is really an area which I, I would hope is interesting for intrepid theorists. So let me just leave you with a thank you to the people that were responsible, the funding agencies. This is actually a picture of Boulder, the way it looks this morning. And I'll just show you some pictures of my, my research group. This is actually a picture. We, we formed a curling group. For those of you that watch the Beijing Olympics, uh, so we have a curling group and here we are reading the journal, the curling journal. So anyway, let me just stop there. Thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions that might, uh, might come up. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, thanks a lot, David, for this wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, we have a number of questions here. Um, ben was the first. Uh, ben, please. Thank you very much, David, for this beautifully broad attack on the thermodynamics and kinetics of, of nucleic acid folding and really a lot of exciting results. I have, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is on transition state theory. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to separate thermodynamic and entropic contributions, as you said, you need to um, choose an attempt frequency essentially. And Correct. so I was wondering what you guys in uh, nucleic acid folding like to use. Yeah, no, it's, you're exactly right. Let me just go back and see. Um, if I've got, let me see. The, the, the short answer to your question is that uh, what we use is uh, you know, the, the entropy itself, first of all, it only influences the entropy. Sure. Uh, secondly, it influences the entropy only logarithmically, right? Uh, so it only depends uh, on the log of the, let me see if I can find that here. Uh, yeah, here, let me just uh, see if I can. Can you see that? Let me just, uh, right, yeah? Yes. So uh, it, it depends only logarithmically on the choice of the, uh, uh, that, but it does depend on, right? So the, the numbers that we choose, you know, might vary between 10 to the 12th per second to values that are maybe more relevant for proteins on the order of, let's say, uh, 10 to the seven per second, 10 to the six per second, but it never influences the delta delta s contributions. The delta de delta s contributions are rigorously independent of the choice of the uh, attempt frequency. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, our numbers are uh, the best attempt uh, at, at thinking of that, uh, but we feel that uh, the insensitivity of, insensitivity of delta delta s is, is important and the, only the logarithmic sensitivity of delta S uh, is also uh, you know, an important consideration. Yeah, but, but so there is no, I mean, in protein foldings that we've always been, or over the last years, uh, 
coming back to about a microsecond as, as a prefactor. Uh, is right. there any, any consensus in the RNA field as to what a, a reasonable prefactor would be? Yeah, the, the, yeah, so the microsecond corresponds to our thinking of an attempt frequency at the level of 10 to the six per second, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, the answer to your question is that there is no consensus in the nucleic acid community, okay? No. <laughs> uh, and part of it is that these studies are a bit, you know, isolated in the way people can study single molecule kinetics as a function of temperature. So in some sense, uh, you know, the, the choices that we make uh, ought to be guided by the wisdom of the protein community. Uh, and let me stretch out. So what we are, what we typically use now is really more on the order of, of 10 to the six per second in order to establish more of a consistency with respect to the protein community. Yeah, all right. And another question, if I may, <clears throat> regards your, your elegant crowding experiments. And so what we found in, in, in several cases now is that scale particle theory clearly breaks down once you start to look at Crowder size dependencies, um, which at least in part appears to be caused by the polymeric nature of many crowding agents that are used, such as PEG. I was wondering whether you've looked at Crowder size dependencies as well um, to see whether uh, scale particle theory might also hold there. Yeah, the, the answer, uh, Ben, is we have looked at, at uh, size dependence. Uh, and uh, we've also looked, most importantly, is the temperature dependence of the crowding, right? Because the temperature dependence of the crowding allows one to uh, see whether or not the crowding effects are entropic or enthalpic in nature. And what I would argue is that Crowding, true crowding is only an entropic effect. Yeah. And many studies are using in protein folding, uh, are using quote crowding agents where if you at least look at the nucleic acid equivalent, there are strong enthalpic contributions as well. And once you have enthalpic and entropic contributions, you really can't think of this as a true crowding phenomena, right? But we have looked at size dependent uh, 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 crowding. Uh, uh, and in particular, I, we've been looking at various lengths of polyethylene glycol uh, and uh, the behavior really looks to be consistent with uh, simple statistical models like scaled particle uh, models for, uh, for the crowding effects. Uh, what's interesting though, uh, is that the size of the crowder uh, ends up, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we always felt intuitively that once your crowder got smaller than a certain size, it, it would no longer crowd the nucleic acid because it would always be able to find a place uh, that was sort of dynamically in equilibrium with the folding. Uh, but what we find is that the crowding gets better and better and better as the crowder size gets smaller and smaller. And that's actually in agreement with some predictions that Dev Thurumalai, uh, uh has made uh, that was surprising to us, but actually really appear to agree with experiment. Yeah, well, that's very interesting because that's the opposite of what we find for proteins in, in several cases. Well, so you know, that's... honestly, Ben, what's interesting is both the similarities and the differences. So we should do yeah. a detailed comparison of and maybe use the same crowding agents and try and look at sort of try and unpeel the entropic and enthalpic contributions. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can discuss this a little more when you're in Switzerland soon. Sounds Thanks great. <laughs> Thanks, David. Okay, so the next question is by W.E. Morna. W.E., please. W.E., are you muted? 
W-E, are you? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. I was muted. I presume you can hear me now, but yeah. I wanted yes, to find it. So that was really spectacular, David. Uh, really, really wonderful. Do you have an understanding why the nucleic acid folding is in the high friction limit? So do you have any uh, sort of physical picture of that? Is this from nearby solvent? Or are there any contributions from nearby oligo, uh, you know, or anything like that? Yeah, no, that's... Uh, the answer is uh, we don't. What's true is that uh, is that the rate constants for uh, for nucleic acid folding are much lower than the diffusion limit, much slower than the diffusion limit. So if you think about just uh, simple statistical models for diffusion access to particular conformations, you overpredict the rate constant by three to four orders of magnitude. So uh, uh, there's many, many collisions uh, in achieving the right transition state. And that's related to be closely to the, uh, to the fact that these barriers for nucleic acid folding are so dynamically, they're so, they're so entropic in nature. So if, if you want a simple picture, and that is that, the nucleic acid can fold so that the so the ends or the folding uh, site is in close proximity, but it's got to try many many times to, for it to be in the right configuration. So it's entropically penalized in terms of getting uh, in the right uh, uh, configuration, uh, but all doing it without really releasing much hydrogen bond formation energy. I, I like to think about this as it, it, you know, in high school, you learn about the lock and key model for, you know, for uh, proteins and, you know, substrates. So the idea is that uh, we approach that, uh, that uh, critical confirmation uh, uh, you know, but without releasing the energy of binding often, and then the key slides beautifully uh, in the lock because we've already paid the penalty, entropic penalty for, for forming that. But I, you know, the bottom line is that we don't know precisely uh, you know, about the friction or non-friction uh, dominated limits, but we think it has to do with why these rate constants are so much slower than the diffusion controlled limit. Thanks. Okay, next one is Stephen Freight. Stephen, please. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to echo how much I enjoyed the presentation. So thank you. I was just, I had, a, I'm curious to get your perspective on whether or not viscosity effects and crowding effects are similar or orthogonal? Because I mean, many of the things that people use to induce crowding, of course, also increase viscosity. And so I'm just wondering from like a physical framework, do, you know, all the results basically fit, you know, if you just like essentially turn everything into viscosity effect, does that work out? Or do you really need to think of these as like separate, you know, concepts in order to understand the data? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Great question. Uh, yeah, you know, glycerol is really is much smaller than the crowders that we're using, which are eighty thousand molecular weight. But right. Ben's question about the size dependence of the crowder is absolutely important. But we've actually, you know, looked in crowding sizes down to things that are not all that, you know, maybe two or three times bigger than than uh, than glycerol itself. Um, but you know, I, our picture is that glycerol is 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 not contributing to the crowding, and the, the effects are, uh, are are really dominated by by viscosity. But you're absolutely right that PEG it contributes to the viscosity uh, uh, of 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 the sample. And what we can do is we can correct the data for that viscosity by looking at the viscosity dependence of the folding. So many of these studies really sort of 
have a beautiful overlap uh, and the analysis of let's say the crowding dependent studies require a detailed understanding of the viscosity dependence as well. Does that answer guess, your question? I guess the question would then be is if you correct for viscosity, is like, is there any effect left? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. you know, the, uh, the, the crowding effects are really the dominant effect. Okay. Absolutely. Right. No, it's, uh, it's really quite dominant. Wow. But, you know, but of course, we're still not getting to excluded volume conditions that are characteristic of a cell, right? And what you mean by the viscosity in a cell, I, I think we've got statistical mechanicians out there that would argue quite rightly that viscosity is sort of a time dependent phenomenon, it depends upon what time window, you, time scale you're looking on, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, in, in any event, we are uh, working uh, uh, up at crowding conditions that are maybe 80% that of a cell, but not yet getting all the way up to fully cellular conditions. But yes, those crowding effects are corrected for the viscosity. Uh, and what you're really seeing is just the viscosity dependent effects or just the crowding dependent effects. All right, thanks. Okay, and the next question is by Franz Mulder. Franz, please. Yes, hello. Um, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I have a question about the pressure dependent study. Uh, did I understand correctly that as you make the DNA longer, then the volume, the delta V also increases? So that's a, a water molecule per nucleotide. Was that what you were saying? It, 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 no, it's actually, it turns out here, look, let's see, I, I cut so many things off of my uh, talk. Let me see if, uh, can you see this? Yep. Okay. So uh, I didn't talk about this, but if you look as a function of the sequence length, here's what the pressure dependent volume change looks like as a function of the number of base pairs. Okay. And what I'm showing you, I believe is, um, seven up to 10 base pairs. And what you can see is that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not too ashamed to really call that almost a straight line, right? Uh, and you can see that there's a linear dependence in the free volume change on the number of base pairs. Uh, and yes, that change uh, really sort of gives you something on the order of about 1.4 cc's per mole, uh, per, uh, per, per mole per base pair. And that's consistent with bulk studies. And you know, what was remarkable to us really was that the two things. One was that if you changed a GC from an AT, that you really see so little change in the free volume. Uh, change uh, upon folding. So honestly, that's something that I just plead help from theory. I don't understand. I, I would have expected a much greater change in volume, uh, you know, for GC or, you know, a much more compact version for GC than AT. Yeah. But the other thing that was surprising uh, is that if you extrapolate this, I'm also not ashamed of extrapolating down to no base pairs. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's definitely a finite limit. When you've got no base pairs, you still have some free volume change. And our picture, okay, you know, modest as it is, is that we, we do a simple linear additive model. And we think about the sequence contributing um, something on the order of 1.4 cc's per mole per base pair, but that there's really a contribution from the DNA looping itself, okay? And that that DNA looping contribution is independent of the number of base pairs in our, in our stem, okay? So both of these are really, you know, if Helmut, if you're on, the, on there, you know, we would love to have predictions from theory as to what these sorts of effects actually really are. Franz, does that answer the question? 
In, in part, be, because one of the things that I've learned from pressure studies on proteins is really that the volume di difference arises from places where the water can't go. And as a case in point, we looked at foldemers in organic solvent, and we can't enfold them with pressure um, because, you know, so, so there could be other factors at play too, right? I mean, you have, may, you might have ion release. You have the fact that the water dissociation constant itself changes with pressure. So I'm thinking right. that there could be quite a few explanations below this that are may, maybe, you know, so, some more if difficult to test than others. I don't know how the sensitivity to ions, if you looked at that at all. Yeah, we, we, we actually are, we're in the middle of doing quite a, you know, a series of studies on ion dependence uh, of, of exactly these sorts of free volume changes. Um, and you're, you're completely correct that, um, let me see if I can, uh, you know. It, so for example, this is the example of manganese riboswitches and adding a, a manganese ion to a, a ligand site and trying to understand whether or not that influences the free volume changes. But Franz, you're, you know, I should underscore that when one measures thermodynamic variables like entropy and enthalpy and free volume change, it doesn't come with you know, an arrow that points to, is this the, you know, uh, is this some water expulsion and reorganization? Is this some ion? attachment uh, to the nucleic acid? Is it just the entropy of the folded structure of the nucleic acid itself? And that's really where strong collaboration between theory and experiment, I think is gonna be uh, crucial. But Franz, it sounds like I can learn from you in terms of what you've done with uh, your pressure dependent uh, protein studies. So uh, why don't you, can you send me an email uh, and then sure. maybe yeah, thank you. maybe we can we, we can have some offline discussions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think Ant is here as well. So there's 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 more people who've done pressure with proteins. Yeah. But thank you. Right. Sure. Okay. I think uh, Peter Wolinas has a comment. Peter. Hey. Uh, th thank you. Actually, several of the things I was going to say were uh, just just uh, explored by David and uh, uh, and Mulder. I, I think, though, for the people not in the in the you know central biz here, I think I, I think that in the in the protein case where we draw these figures of things like funnels and so on, we always in that field uh, know that what we're writing down is the uh, landscape which has already been averaged over the solvent. So many of the ideas in protein folding about the nature of transition states and so on come. Uh, where we've already averaged over the solvent. And if we were to worry about the phenomena of the solvent, then we'd get into the same complexities uh, talked about here because of the phenomenon, both of cold denaturation under temperature and pressure denaturation under temperature. So the reason why the funnel and so on has been useful in proteins is that there are 20 amino acids and they more or less can be interchanged almost you know, trivially uh, whereas, you know, we have only four bases and they're very rigid rules of base pairing. And because of that, you can't do studies that mostly just slightly change the structure. You either completely screw things up or you, or you, uh, so you can't base pair anymore, or you have only one other choice, AT to GC. And I think that's why it's sort of seeing what part of it is purely structural is much harder uh, if you try to study uh, just natural RNA. I mean, it may be possible to do uh, unnatural bases and things like that, but I think that might be a useful way to separate the, the structural things from the, from the solvent um, thing. So that, that, that was one comment. Um, the other is I think there are many differences of RNA landscapes from DNA, um, sorry, from, from proteins, uh, some, some very deep, some sort of uh, uh, superficial, but but I would say one thing that's superficial that I've always noticed is that you know, the bases are much, much bigger than, um, than, than amino acids and uh, the bases with their you know, sugar. And I think that that's why you know, the, the, the solvent effects 
are kind of closer to what you would think from uh, just um, you know Brownian particles and, and and things of that sort. So so I think there are some things that make RNA a little bit easier uh, to think about than than, than proteins uh, too. So. I, I like to hear that, Peter. So is is that an implicit promise that you're going to start looking at this? Well, we we we've, we've uh, there, we we we're, we've already uh, written papers on RNA and protein, but I guess we always have to throw some protein in there. Uh, but I think you can find it on BioArchive. Uh, we're doing things on RNA uh, binding to proteins for problems in memory formation and stuff. So, can yeah. can I ask you what's your opinion on uh, pressure dependent denaturation of nucleic acids? Then is it voids? Is it uh, you know, uh, well, there, exchange the, water in the case um, of in the case of proteins, I would say it can almost completely be understood in terms of the solvent effects, actually, uh, in a fairly quantitative way. Even though uh, people like to talk about voids, I think that that you always have to do a little bit of uh, standing on your head uh, to 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 make those things uh, work. Uh, maybe it'll be simpler for for RNA. But you know, basically, how the interactions between base pairs change with pressure uh, when average over solvent, I, I don't think I've seen any clear uh, paper on that, although it may exist in the literature. I mean, uh, MD people have done a hell of a lot of work. So it, it's possible that that has been done by someone years ago. Uh, and I don't know about it. Yeah, we, I mean, Helmut's on, the, uh, on, on this Zoom call. Uh, he may have a, a good opinion on this, but we, we, we tried using, you know, just basic uh, MD, sort of amber-based MD with typical force fields and water, water potentials. And we could not make uh, nucleic acids denature uh, under pressure. Uh, and so and we're wondering, we're curious as to what the reason might be and why it's not so predictable with the current set of force fields. Probably too slow. Probably too slow. <laughs> well, you, what, what we are doing, Helmut, uh, since you're on now, is we would start the nucleic acids out uh, in, a, uh, in the crystal structure for the tetraloop tetraloop receptor. And so what we could do is we could start the system out uh, already in, uh, in, in a confirmation that was close enough to the actual final state that we really could run the trajectories long enough for them to come to equilibrium. So I think at least in that favorable case where we know enough about the crystal structure, we, we really can make the statement about what the free volume changes are uh, uh, to compare and to look at those uh, you know, that behavior as a function of pressure and extract the free volume changes. So, but Helmut, you're the pro. Uh, I would love to see you, you know, tackle this and, and nice. tell me. Be nice. <laughs> Sorry. It's hard to do oh. online. <laughs> Yeah, but then you are saying sorry for jumping in, but then you are saying you you don't see the volume change. You it's not so much about uh, the unfolding folding or denaturation, but you don't see the volume change in the That's what we. You... Well, I mean, what we see is two things. We see uh, a volume change that is considerably smaller than uh, than yeah. than what is experimentally measured and the wrong sign, right? So this is like that joke about, you know, uh, we're lost, but we're making good progress, right? Uh, we're getting, yeah. we're lost, but we're getting there quickly. No, we, we're, it's even the wrong sign. So, wow. uh, so understanding the magnitude uh, almost, me <laughs> if we're not going in the right direction, it doesn't matter how fast we're going. Yeah. Before going into that, I'll probably have a longer chat with Peter. Well, I, I was going to say that, you know, in the case of protein uh, folding, uh, the pressure denatured state involves putting waters between the amino acids and yeah. sort of there's a really advantage to the solvent separated pair. Now that solvent separation depends on the ratio, to some extent depends on the ratio of the diameter of the object, the objects that are being held together and the diameter of water. So it's like, 
it's a completely different thing for a big, uh, you know, mm. uh, base than it is for anything except maybe phenylalanine even or something like that. So, so I can imagine that this is quite sensitive to the difference in size of RNA bases and amino acid side chains. Uh, Chaps, I, I, I don't want to spoil a beautiful discussion really, but there are still two questions left that we need, sure, to, sorry. We need to address. Um, I, th I think um, the next one would be Hagai Shapira and then Ben. Hagai? Hi. Uh, hello. My question is regarding uh, non specific DNA interaction. And if uh, you have tested anything with molecular crowding affecting that, reducing that uh, would be what I'm interested in. Yeah, no, that's a. <clears throat> super important consideration. And uh, what we've, <clears throat> because we can do these studies, these crowding studies as a function, this is a bit related to what I said to Ben or Franz uh, just a few minutes ago, but what we can see is that the, uh, the changes due to crowding uh, have, uh, have no impact on the uh, the enthalpy. It's purely an entropic effect. So uh, what we can be quite sure of is that the crowder is not at least differentially uh, stabilizing, uh, you know, enthalpically, it's not differentially stabilizing the unfolded or, or folded state. Uh, but that's a very important consideration. And it turns out that uh, glycerol uh, is the right confirmation to have essentially no enthalpic contribution, differential enthalpic contribution, and so is PEG. Uh, PEG has no differential enthalpic contribution, but we've looked at a number of you know, uh, crowders that the protein folders love, like FICOL and dextran and things like that. And those we can really see with nucleic acids have very strong enthalpic contributions, differential enthalpic contributions. And so it's a much more complicated story looking at FICOL and dextran induced crowding, at least for nucleic acids. And that's a paper that came out quite recently, but that's an important consideration is, are we differentially stabilizing the enthalpy of the folded and unfolded structures? And the answer is you need to choose carefully and test for it with temperature dependent studies. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay, Ben. So speaking of crowding, I, I have another question because you, you went, mentioned in, in a previous response to one of the questions that you're, um, correcting for viscosity, which is something that's relatively obvious what to do if you use a very small molecule crowder, right? But once you go to large crowders, then viscosity becomes a strongly length dependent animal. And then it's no longer so obvious which viscosity to correct for. And yeah. so if you, if you measure, for instance, protein dynamics in large crowders, they behave essentially as they were in water. But uh, then the question is, what viscosity do you use to correct for, for large crowders, essentially? Yeah. I mean, I think really uh, it may be that we've not corrected correctly for viscosity. The effects are relatively small, though. The crowding contributions, um, you know, uh, are, 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 I mean, I'd, uh, hard to put a number on it, but. Uh, I would say our, the great majority really is due to uh, something that we, we think of as being a, an excluded volume contribution uh, and the change in uh, uh, you know, you know, the, accessible, uh, uh, the, the accessibility of, for inserting a crowder in between two, two structures. But Ben, let me, you know, since we're gonna talk about this more offline, let me look back and and look at the corrections because it may be, may may well be that we 
were naive about how we corrected for it, but I'm quite sure it's a small fraction of the crowding effect that, that we report. Yeah, thanks very much, David. Okay, so so I will not add another question, just just a comment, uh, David. I think uh, regarding Ben's original question with uh, regarding the pre-exponential factor, that the attempt frequency, you might find some realistic numbers in one of David Woods, uh, uh, Michael Woodside's papers um, on because he measured transition path time distributions for DNA hairpin. And I think he got diffusion coefficients at the barrier top out. I don't know whether he also got curvatures uh, uh, of the uh, at the barrier top. But I see, I remember that the diffusion coefficient were orders of magnitude lower than what we would expect for proteins. So um, I think it, it's worth having a look into that to see. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Michael, Mike, Michael, I think was even on the call, but uh, you know, you know, what's, what's, what's interesting is that we can, um, you know, it, uh, because we store our photons on the, nanosecond level, in principle, we could look at, we could use the beautiful work of, you know, Bill Eaton and Attila Zabo, and in principle, really look at these barrier crossings, uh, you know, if, if we looked hard enough with fast enough time resolution, we might be able to actually extract that information uh, from just FRET studies. Uh, but we, we've not been bold enough yet, but I'm hoping that Attila, whom, I'm, whom I've known for years, could be interested in, in helping, you know, a humble experimentalist uh, think about these things in nucleic acids. Right, sounds great. Okay, thank so you. David, thank you very much for a wonderful talk and for this lovely discussion. Thanks everybody for contributing. And, um, well, I think this is it. Uh, have a great day, David. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good night uh, for uh, uh, Gilad and me. <laughs> All right. Thank, thanks. Thank, thank you, you. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.